Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, I'd like to thank Andy in his absence for all his efforts in bringing us here, in, in particular for inviting me to this beautiful campus and to meet all you beautiful people and the beautiful mathematics you've been showing me and I hope will do for the rest of the week. Um, I have a confession to make. I'm not a graph theorist or, um, or even a combinatorialist. I'm a group theorist, but um, most of my career I've been applying group theory to other parts of mathematics and in particular graphs and surfaces. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, but before I do that, let me also thank Misha Clean for ensuring for several decades that I never stray too far from algebraic graph theory. So um, I'm going to talk about um, maps. And um, in the general theme of the talk is that it'll be a group theoretic approach. So there will be some group theory in it. And I'll be applying the groups to embeddings of graphs on surfaces. That's what I mean by a map. Um, it's a very general theory, but to keep everything simple, I'll concentrate on compact-oriented surfaces, though um, most of what I say can be generalized. There'll be two main topics. The first one will be about regular maps. Um, regular here means having a high degree of symmetry. And um, in particular, the, the underlying graph has to be arc transitive. And I'll be talking about uh, various classes of arc transitive graphs um, where one can apply certain techniques from group theory, mainly finite group theory, though occasionally combinatorial and geometric group theory. In the second part of the talk, I'll concentrate on the way in which certain embeddings of bipartite graphs provide a rather surprising link between two other areas of mathematics. One is the theory of Riemann surfaces, and the other is the theory of algebraic number fields and their Galois groups. Maps on surfaces, you can think of them as being motivated, first of all, by late 19th century mathematics, in particular the four-color problem, efforts of people like Hefter, for instance, and also function theory, work of Klein and other people, um, using tessellations of surfaces to describe certain automorphic functions and certain groups that act on surfaces. But there was a later stimulus in the late 19th cent uh, 20th century when Grotendieck um, became interested in maps as providing this bridge uh, um, as providing this bridge um, at the end. OK, so um, let's start with the definition. A map, for me, then, it's an embedding of a graph in a surface. And the rules are that the graph is going to be finite and connected. I'm allowing loops, as in the example here. I'm also allowing multiple edges. The surface will be compact, connected, oriented. So we've chosen an orientation, and it's without boundary. All of those conditions can be relaxed, but I'm not going to do that, except in one rather obvious case where the surface will not be compact. We'll come to that in a minute. There's an example, and that's drawn, well, it's drawn on the plane, but if you um, use stereographic projection, you can think of it as a map on the sphere. And, well, if you get bored, it does represent a particular mathematician, and I will tell you later who it is. A bipartite map is simply one in which the graph is bipartite. So you'll have black and white vertices, and the only edges go between black and white vertices. Now, there's a very useful and concise way of describing a bipartite map, and that's by a pair of permutations. We have the orientation of the surface. Uh, maybe I'll switch that off, I don't know. Yeah, there, there we are. There's the orientation, the, the clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise orientation of the surface. Um, I say clockwise because the clock in my office goes the other way around, just to make the students feel a bit uneasy. 
x rotates edges around their incident black vertices. So if you start with the edge here, x takes it to this edge, x squared would take it here, x cubed, and then back to e. So it rotates around black vertices. So the edges around that blur, um, black vertex go around like that. Y does exactly the same thing with the white vertices. So if you start with the edge here, you go to EY. EY squared is there. EY cubed is back here. Warning at the bottom, these are not, in general, automorphisms. They tear the graph apart. They don't preserve incidence. They're just permutations. What about um, faces? Well, um, if you define Z, to be the inverse of xy down here, then that rotates edges around faces. If you don't believe me, well, e z takes e two steps around to here. Now do x, that takes it back here. Now do y, that takes it back here. So z, x, y is the identity, and therefore z is the inverse of that. But you have to remember that um, z rotates um, edges two steps around the faces whereas x and y go one step around the black and white vertices. You've got these two permutations. They generate a group. It's finite because there are only finitely many edges, and it's transitive because the graph is connected. That's one of the assumptions. So if you start with any, vertex, uh, any edge, you can get to any other edge by applying x and y in some order. OK, so at the top here, we have our bipartite map. It's, defined, it, it's described by a two-generator finite transitive permutation group acting on the edge set. The black and the white vertices correspond to cycles of x, and the faces correspond to cycles of z. And you can reverse this process. If you give me a, such a finite transitive group, G, with a particular generating pair, then I can use that as a recipe to reconstruct not just the graph, but actually the surface. Because I can look at the cycles of x and y. That tells me how to join the edges together. And then the cyclic order within those cycles gives me the neighborhood of each vertex on the surface. So you can reconstruct, at least topologically, um, the bipartite map from that data of those two permutations. And there's no, an easy example down here. If you take um, A5, the alternating group, in its natural representation, take x to be of order 3, so it's a 3 cycle, y to have order 2, so it's a double transposition. The only way they can generate A5 is if their product has order 5. Um, so you get one face, a single cycle of z, and y you have black and white vertices, and th this is the bipartite map that you get. It's a map on the sphere. Finally, at the bottom, um, isomorphisms of um, bipartite maps. By an isomorphism, I mean a homeomorphism, uh, orientation preserving homeomorphism of the surface surfaces that takes one embedded graph to the other, preserving colors. And it's easy to see that these correspond to group or isomorphisms which match up generators in the obvious way. Now, this group G here, it's called the monodromy group. I'll explain the name a bit later. What about automorphisms? Well, the automorphisms of any bipartite map B, these can be thought of as permutations of the edges which commute with X and Y. They have to preserve the structure. The structure is determined by X and Y, so they need to commute with x and y. And because x and y generate g, that's equivalent to commuting with g. So the automorphism group is simply the centralizer of g in the whole symmetric group. Now, because g acts transitively, well, the centralizer of any transitive group is semi-regular. The stabilizer of an edge is the identity. And moreover, this is another fact about transitive groups. Um, you can identify the automorphism group with this quotient. Take the normalizer of GE, factor out GE, that's isomorphic to the aut automorphism group. Now, the most symmetric, 
of these bipartite graphs are those where A is as large as possible, namely transitive on the edges, so that every edge looks like every other edge. And it's an easy exercise to check that these three conditions are equivalent. B is regular if and only if A is as large as possible. We know it's semi-regular, well, if it's actually transitive, so it acts regularly. Um, that's this condition. G, we know that G acts transitively if it's as small as possible, namely acting regularly. And again, that's equivalent to B being regular. And in, if this happens, then A and G are isomorphic. And you should really think of them as the left and right regular representations of the same group. But you have to be careful. They're not, as permutation groups, they're not in general equal. They're different subgroups of the symmetric group, but they do commute with each other. So here's a couple of examples. There's a very well-known regular bipartite map. It's just the cube um, thought of as on the sphere. And um, the automorphism group equal to the monodromy group is A4. It's not S4. It's not the rotation group of the cube because we have to preserve vertex colors. So it's a subgroup of index 2. And over on the right, you've got the same graph. That's the cube graph, but it's now embedded in a torus. Um, rather than six square faces over on the left, you've got four hexagonal faces. And what you have to do is identify opposite sides of the hexagon. So that side is identified with that one, and so on. And um, you can check you get a torus with four hexagons on it. One way of thinking of this on, over on the right is to s imagine the whole plane tessellated with these hexagons. You can extend this pattern to cover the whole plane. And then what we've done here is factored out a, a group of translations generated by these side pairing. So any two of these side pairing um, translations will generate a group, and we factored it out. That idea is going to come back again later, but in a hyperbolic geometric context, not in a Euclidean geometric context. OK, th there are a few numerical parameters you can attach to these bipartite maps. The Euler characteristic, it's the usual formula, the alternating sum of the number of vertices, edges, and faces. Um, X and Y, each cycle of X and each cycle of Y contributes a vertex. Um, faces come from the cycles of Z. And the edges, well, these are just the points being permuted. So that's the number of cycles of the identity. So that's a formula for the Euler characteristic, and then there's the usual genus formula. And um, it's useful to have this triple LMN of orders of x, y, and z denoting the type of the map. These are just the least common multiples of cycle lengths. In the case of a regular map, all the cycles of x have the same length, namely L. And likewise for y and z, so you can count the number of cycles easily, and then you, you just plug that into the formula, and you've got the characteristic. So if we go back to our two examples, then this one over on the left has type 3, 3, 2. That means the black and the white vertices all have valency 3. The faces are squares, and remember you have to divide by 2 because Z sends everything two steps around. So Z has order 2 here. Over here, Z has order 3. So that one over there has type 3, 3, 3. Now, I've been discriminating against all uh, non-bipartite maps, and that's a bit unfair. There's all sorts of legislation in the UK that says you can't discriminate against certain minorities or majorities in this case. So what about non-bipartite maps? Well, there's, there's no problem, really. If you've got a, um, a map, let's say M here, that's not bipartite, all you need to do is make it bipartite by inserting a white vertex in every edge. And this gives you a bipartite map. 
and you can apply exactly the same technique. You can define the permutations, x and y. The only difference now is that y must have order 2, because the white vertices and valency two. And this idea, it, or variations on it, of representing maps by permutations, it's been attributed to many people, Hefter, Tut, Edmonds. The earliest reference I know is in a letter by Hamilton in 1856. It's a letter in which he describes what we now call Hamiltonian cycles. And it's very clear that he is talking about monodromy permutations and not automorphisms. And he did it for the um, icosahedron and the dodecahedron, and then he just abandoned it. He never ret returned to this idea, but it's clear from his remarks that he knew it generalized. If anyone knows of an earlier reference, please do tell me. Okay, if we do that to our um, one-armed bandit, let's just do it here. So here's the one-armed bandit, and what we have to do is put white vertices. There are six edges, if I've done it correctly. And the edges, in general, the edges of this bipartite map correspond to the arcs of the original map. So you can think of x and y as permuting arcs of m or permuting edges of b. And if you do that here, well, we've now got 12 edges on that bipartite map. So we're going to get a group of degree 12. It's the Mathieu group, one of these sporadic simple groups, a group of order 95,040. And, well, it, com it comes up in many contexts. For instance, the automorphism group of a um, Steiner system. So the mathematician uh, denoted in this um, um, little um, drawing here is Mathieu. And it was pictures like this that motivated Grotendieck to call this theory des enfants, children's drawings, because when you actually do the, do the drawings, they often come out like, uh, looking like a child's drawing of a human being. Well, which groups could be monodromy groups of bipartite maps? Any finite two-generator permutation group. So any two-generator group, finite group, and that's a huge collection. It, in, it includes all the finite simple groups. It's a lot to deal with. It's very convenient to replace this collection by one single group. And this is the free group of rank two. I called it delta up there. Um, freely generated by capital X and capital Y. And if you've got a bipartite map described by a monodromy group G, then you can use this to get a, re a transitive representation of delta. Just map capital X and Y to lowercase x and Y, and you've now got the free group delta acting transitively on this finite set of edges. And the transitive representations of delta correspond to the conjugacy classes of subgroups of finite index. These, these are called um, map subgroups. So um, we've now got this um, correspondence between bipartite maps and conjugacy classes of subgroups of delta, namely the stabilizers of edges. And um, Properties of bipartite maps correspond to properties of these subgroups. And the most useful one is that the regular maps correspond to normal subgroups. And then, well, we know already that for a regular map, A is isomorphic to G. And then j just by the first isomorphism theorem, that's also <coughs> delta over M. So a couple of examples here. If you take M to be as large as possible, so that delta is acting on a single point, A and G are, are the identity, you get the trivial bipartite map. And there it is. It, it's so embarrassingly trivial that I've drawn it very small there, but it's a map on the sphere with one vertex, one <coughs> of each color, one edge, and one face. A bit more interesting is example two. Philip Hall, in a famous paper in 1935, 
showed, among many other things, that um, the free group of rank 2 has 19 normal subgroups isomorphic to A5. Actually, what he did was he proved that A5 has 19 generating pairs up to, isomor uh, up to automorphisms. So what you get then is 19 regular bipartite maps with that automorphism <coughs> group. Some of them are very familiar, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. If you make them into bipartite maps in the way I did over there, you get regular bipartite maps of those types. Um, but there's also uh, others of higher genus, like the great dodecahedron. Um, if, you, if you take the icosahedron, then uh, the neighborhood of one <coughs> vertex looks like this. You have a vertex here, and then a pentagon around it, something like that. So you have five vertices around it. And what you do is you delete the triangular faces and replace them with a pentagon joining up the neighbors. And if you do that for all the vertices, you get a map with 12 pentagonal faces, and that's the great dodecahedron. It has genus 4, and it has the same symmetry group as the um, original icosahedron. So that gives you a map of type 525. So that's the great dodecahedron. And there are others as well. You can also um, enumerate not just the regular bipartite maps, but all of them. An easy count, um, check of the subgroups of A5 shows you that it has seven faithful transitive representations, and it's got 19 generating pairs up to automorphisms, and so you get 133 bipartite maps. Right? I certainly don't have a list of all of them, but the one that we had earlier is one of them. That's a non-regular bipartite map with monodromy group A5. Any decent category should have not just objects, but morphisms. And the morphisms here are coverings. These are coverings of the surfaces, possibly branched, um, in which the, um, the graph on the lower surface uh, lifts to the graph upstairs. I don't want to go through the precise details, but I think it's clear what sort of um, objects we're talking, morphisms we're talking about here. And these correspond to inclusions between the corresponding map subgroups of delta. And the normal inclusions, if M1 is normal in M2, you have a quotient group, and um, this acts as a group of automorphisms of B1, and you have a, a regular covering induced by this group of automorphisms. And a, a theorem that David Singerman and I proved long, long time ago now, when we were starting this subject, is tells you that every bipartite map, or indeed every map, you can delete bipartite from this theorem if you want, every map is the quotient of a regular map by a group of automorphisms. And the proof is really very straightforward. It's the only thing I'm going to prove today. If you start with your bipartite map corresponding to M, subgroup M, you simply take the core of M, that's the intersection of the conjugates, it's the largest normal subgroup contained in delta, and it again has finite index, and let B tilde be the regular map corresponding to that, and then you just check that it has all the correct properties up there. That theorem is not at all obvious if you don't bring some group theory in. In fact, many of the people in topological graph theory were surprised or even disbelieving when we told them this, then we just show them the proof. But you have to have some group theory to make sense of it. So there's the theorem again. I just put it up there again. And the consequence is that for many purposes, it's enough to study regular bipartite maps and their automorphism groups. Because all of the others have this form, quotient of a regular map by some subgroup of the automorphism group. So if you know all the regular maps and their automorphism groups, and in principle, you know everything. And so here's, here's the, the example again. If you apply that to this particular bipartite map B, then B tilde is the, in fact, it's the dodecahedral map made bipartite, um, as over there. 
And then the subgroups you have to quotient out is A4, one of the um, point stabilizers in A5. So here's um, another example. If you take um, Monsieur Mathieu over there, what's his regular cover? Well, these regular covers can sometimes be much bigger than the original map. And in this particular case, the genus turns out to be 3,601. It's big because M12 is big. Um, so I've not drawn it for you. You have to imagine it. But um, it's a uh, trivalent map with all... Uh, the faces are 11 gons. It's got automorphism group M12, and the subgroup, subgroup you have to factor out is M11, the smallest of the Mathieu groups. That's the point stabilizer in M12. And it was this sort of idea that very simple sketches like that can embody really very complicated mathematical structures like M12 or a surface of genus 3601. That was what excited Grotendieck about 30 years ago and um, got him into this subject, which he promptly dropped because he withdrew from mathematics and went to live on a mountain in the Pyrenees and didn't talk to anyone. But he left a great big pile of notes which um, outlined his ideas and people have been trying to understand them ever since. Now what can you do with this group theoretic machinery? Well, you can classify. This is something that we all love doing. And you can classify regular maps or regular bipartite maps in several ways. And traditionally, three strategies have been adopted. One is to classify by the automorphism group. For regular maps, that's the same as the monodromy group. And what you're really doing there is classifying all generating pairs up to automorphisms. So if you're given a specific group, then, as long as it's not too complicated, there is some hope of classifying generating pairs. For instance, by doing Merbius inversion within the subgroup lattice. There are techniques for doing that. And we've done that already, but I'd essentially I outlined the A5 example, getting those 133 possible um, bipartite maps. You can classify by the surface. Um, going up from genus 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then initially this was done by hand up to genus about 6 or 7, really rather laborious um, problem. But then computers came along and um, completely revolutionized the situation. And if you go to Marston Conder's website, he's in Auckland, and he has now got lists of... Um, regular maps up to genus 301. And these were found by using some very clever computational group theory to classify low-index subgroups of triangle groups. And this is very useful because we've now got e experimental evidence that goes far enough to make conjectures or um, verify or disprove um, conjectures. The third way is to classify regular maps in terms of the graph. The graph has to be arc transitive. Um, that's implied by the regularity condition. And, and what you can do is look at your favorite class of arc transitive graphs and try to find um, suitable subgroups of the automorphism group. Um, they have to be two generator subgroups. They have to act in the right way on the edges. And a number of classes of Graphs have been classified in this way, complete, complete multipartite, etc. Um, but there are plenty more one can work on um, if one wishes. So what I want to do is um, tell you the situation with complete graphs and then complete bipartite graphs. So the complete graphs, um, Norman Biggs, another mention from Norman this morning, in 1971, he showed, he was building on earlier work of Hefter, he showed that um, the complete graph Kn has a regular embedding if and only if n is a prime power. And the construction that he gave was to build them as Cayley maps over the additive group of a finite field. That's why n has to be a prime power. You take the field to be the vertex set, 
and then for each vertex you specify the neighbors to have this cyclic order. You take a generator alpha of the multiplicative group, that's a cyclic group, and the neighbors are v plus 1, v plus alpha, and so on in that cyclic order. And um, what you find is that the automorphism group is just the affine group of the field. And um, a number of choices of alpha, well, you have a cyclic group of order n minus 1 here, so the number of choices is phi of n minus 1, phi is Euler's function. And you can show that um, two different choices of alpha give you isomorphic maps if and only if they are equivalent under the automorphism group, uh, under the Galois group, which is cyclic of order E. Um, then Lynn James and I proved that um, Biggs's examples are in fact the only ones, and that relies on work of Zassenhaus classifying the sharply two transitive permutation groups. The point here is that the autom automorphism group for a complete uh, graph, it has to act sharply too transitively on the vertices because every pair of vertices um, are joined by an edge and if you have two edges and there has to be an automorphism taking one to the other so the group is acting too transitively on the vertices and the stabilizer of an edge is the identity so there's only one automorphism taking one edge to another so <coughs> you've got a sharply two transitive group and um, Zassenhaus classified those and you can read off from his classification that um, the automorphism group has to be this. Then you've got to look for the generating pairs and that's um, not too difficult. So, so you have that um, classification and that, that I think was the first class of arc transitive graphs to be classified in this way. And there are two e examples. If you take K5, it, it has two regular embeddings. They're both on a torus. Again, you have to identify opposite sides to get a torus. So in the left-hand example, that side and that side are identified. And that means that the, the four vertices around the corners become one vertex. So you've got four vertices in the middle, and then there's one vertex at the corners. And the same thing happens over here. This is just the mirror image. These are not isomorphic. They're only isomorphic if you reverse orientation, which we're not allowed to do. So those are regarded as two different oriented maps. And um, they come from taking two different generators of the multiplicative group. This is the integers mod 5, you can choose 2 or its inverse 3 as the generator and it's an easy exercise to check that um, you get these two different embeddings when you label the vertices with integers mod 5. Uh, there's a similar story for complete bipartite graphs but um, this time there's always at least one embedding. There's no restriction on n there is at least one embedding. This is the standard embedding. And again, it's a Cayley map. Um, this time the group is the integers mod 2n. Um, the generating set is all the odd integers in ascending order. And so the vertices are in that cyclic, um, neighbors of a vertex are in that cyclic order. It's bipartite, simply color the um, even and odd integers black and white and you can check you've got a regular map and that is the genus. Um, and I'll just show you two examples. Those are the standard embeddings of K33. That's on a torus. Again, I identify opposite sides to get a torus. This one is K44. It's on a surface of genus 3. You've got a, a, it's a bit hard to see, but the polygon around the outside is a 16 gone. And you have to identify pairs. I've only given you two identifications. A goes with A, B goes with B, and the others you can get by rotational symmetry. So I didn't want to clutter up the picture, but you can check you do get a surface of genus 3 from that. So those are the standard embeddings of K33 and K44. And um, 
Unfortunately, for most N, there are some non-standard embeddings. I'll just show you one of those. That's a non-standard embedding for K44. Um, you can see the four white vertices, and when you do the identifications of opposite sides, you get, you get four black vertices, and you can check it is K44. That's got genus 1, so it's not the standard embedding, which has genus 3. So um, there's a long story here. Um, over about a, a decade, there's a whole team of people, Shofei Du, Jin Ho Kwak, Roman Nadella, Martin Scoviera, who are both here, Andrei Zalatosh and I, wrote a series of about six or seven papers, which eventually resulted in a classification of these. It's far too complicated to state, unfortunately. Um, it would take me about 10 to 15 minutes simply to state the result. But, um, the classification, it used some um, old work of Huppert and V. Lant from the 1950s on factorizations of groups, groups which factorize as a product, not necessarily a semi or a direct or a semi direct product, just a set theoretic product of cyclic groups. And even earlier work of Philip Hall, where he generalized Celo's theorems. Celo's theorems tell you about a single prime within a finite group. But in a finite solvable group, you can go from single primes to sets of primes. And we needed this to fit together the different prime powers appearing in N. So, we, so there is a quite um, satisfactory, complete classification. So, um, right, I want to change theme slightly now to look at a non-compact Map. This is the universal bipartite map. If we go back to the map subgroups of delta and take the smallest possible one, okay, it's not got finite index, but let's do it anyway. Take the identity subgroup, what map do we get? Well, it's this one down here, and, or at least that's a bit of it. The surface is the hyperbolic plane, the upper half plane. The vertices are the rationals A over B in reduced form, where B is odd. And you color them black or white, as A is even or odd. So you can see some of the vertices down here. You have an edge from A over B to C over D, which you draw as a hyperbolic geodesic, if and only if this determinant condition is satisfied. So you get a graph, uh, a map looking like this. Um, what about the rationals A over B with B even? Well, they're not drawn, but they're actually the vertex centers, uh, the face centers. So for instance, this face here on the left has center down here at a half. One over two is thought of as the center of that face. And infinity, which is one over zero, that's up here, well, even higher up in heaven, that's the center of this big face out here. And you should think of this pattern as repeating every two steps along. So you've got this non-compact uh, map. And um, we need to know the automorphisms of it. Well, they form a two-generator free group. The generators are two Möbius transformations, x and y. And what they do is x fixes the black vertex at the origin, and it rotates the incident edges cyclically around them like that. And y does exactly the same thing at the white vertex at 1. It fixes 1, and it cyclically rotates the edges incident with it. If you know about uh, the modular group, this is a subgroup of index 6. It's a normal subgroup of index 6. It's the con principal congruence subgroup of level 2. But you don't need to know that. Now, any bipartite map is a quotient of that universal bipartite map by some subgroup of delta. Now, B infinity that I just showed you, it's not just on any old surface, it's on a Riemann surface, namely the hyperbolic plane. So, this quotient inherits a Riemann surface structure. It's not compact, there are punctures, but if you fill them in at the vertices, that's a typo. That should be face centers. 
And if you fill in finitely many punctures, you get a compact Riemann surface. So bipartite maps give compact Riemann surfaces. Which do you get? Which Riemann surfaces come from that bipartite maps? Well, they can't be all of them. Tachmuller theory tells you that for each genus there are uncountably many compact Riemann surfaces, but you've got only countably many maps, so only a few can arise. And there's a r r remarkable characterization of them. Riemann, 150 years ago, told us that compact Riemann surfaces are identical to complex algebraic curves. So they can be defined as the zero sets of finitely many polynomials. And Bielli's theorem, as reformulated by Gerton, Deke, and Wolfart, tells you that the compact Riemann surfaces you get out of bipartite maps are precisely those for which these polynomials can have algebraic numbers as coefficients. He actually stated it as a lemma in the inverse Galois problem, but it was Grothendieck who noticed the significance of it, and then it was reformulated by him and Wolfart in these ways. So these bipartite maps, they're telling us that a certain class of Riemann surfaces, namely those obtained from bipartite maps, is precisely equivalent to algebraic curves defined over the algebraic number field. Very surprising. When I first, first saw this result, I nearly fell off my chair. OK, one of these curves defined over the algebraic numbers, we call it a Bielli curve. And um, there's more to it. The, the, um, the bipartite map corresponds to incl an inclusion of a subgroup M, a finite index in the free group. And that inclusion induces a covering of, um, by B of the trivial bipartite map, the one with a single edge. And that gives you a covering of the sphere by X. I'll just draw it over, over, over there. You should think of the sphere as the projective line over the complex numbers. It's just C union, union infinity. So what you have downstairs is um, P1 of C, C union infinity. So you've got infinity up here. You've got zero down here. We put a black vertex there. And one is over here. And we put a white vertex there. And then along the unit, in unit interval, we put an edge. So that's our trivial bipartite map B1 down there. And upstairs, we've got this compact Riemann surface. Let's say it has maybe genus 2, something like that. So here's our algebraic curve, x. And then you simply lift, via this covering beta, you lift this bipartite map here upstairs. So just take the inverse image of it. Now, this covering, it's branched only over naught, 1, and infinity. Branching over 0 allows the black vertices up here to have any valency you like. Branching over 1 allows the white vertices to have any valency they like. And the branching over infinity allows the faces to have any valency you like. So by lifting the trivial bipartite map by a beta, you get the bipartite map on the compact Riemann surface. And it's a very tidy bipartite map because the edges are geodesics and the angles around the vertices are all the same. So no matter how badly you drew the original bipartite map, it could be a very wobbly but topologically correct picture, this theory straightens it all out. It imposes a complex structure on the map. So these maps, Grotendieck called them design l'enfant, children's drawings, or simply design. So here's an example. Um, if you take the standard embedding of KNN, if, you, if we go back, yeah, um, there are two examples. There are standard embeddings of K33 and K44. Um, if you take um, the standard embedding of any KNN, 
then the subgroup M that you get, it's the subgroup of the free group generated by commutators and nth powers. If you, that's a normal subgroup. If you factor it out, the automorphism group is the product of two cyclic groups of order n. The curve you get, it's a very famous curve. It's the nth degree Fermat curve. It's defined by this equation, and you can see the link with Fermat looking at that equation. That's a curve of genus n minus 1, n minus 2 over 2. And the Bielli function is very simple to describe. Um, these are homogeneous coordinates, x0, x1, x2. You take a point with those coordinates to x0 over x2 to the n, and you can check that it's branched just over 0, 1, and infinity. And you can also see the automorphism group here. The automorphism group is the product of two cyclic groups of order n. Well, simply multiply x0 and x1 by any nth roots of unity. The equation is preserved, so you have an automorphism of the curve. And that is the full automorphism group of the bipartite map. Galois theory comes in at this point. I just told you that a design or a bipartite map can be identified with a Bielli pair. X here is a Bielli surface, so it's an algebraic curve defined over the algebraic numbers. And then beta is this covering, it's this rational function that's also defined over the algebraic numbers. Now, the Galois group of the algebraic number field, it's called the absolute Galois group, it's just the group of field automorphisms. It's a very important object in algebraic number theory, and it's a very mysterious object. It's very complicated, but it's important to understand it. It acts on these Bielli pairs. These are defined by, by equations with algebraic number coefficients. So you can simply let the Galois group act on those coefficients, and it induces an action on Bielli pairs, and hence on Desaint. And Grotendieck's suggestion was that we should use this action as a way of studying the absolute Galois group in order to find out more about it. So here's a rather easy example. If you take Monsieur Mathieu over on the left, and here's Madame Mathieu over on the right, do a few calculations, and you find that the number field required to define them is the quadratic field, q root minus 11. That's got a Galois group of order 2, simply generated by complex conjugation. And surprise, surprise, complex conjugation transposes those two. Well, how could it be otherwise? But there are much more interesting examples. And here's um, one of the first non-trivial examples. If you take these three bipartite maps of genus 0, it turns out that they form an orbit under the absolute Galois group. They are defined over the splitting field of that particular polynomial. That's got Galois group S3, and it permutes them transitively. Now, clearly, the top two are mirror images of the other, so that's no surprise. But this one down here doesn't seem to have much connection with the other two, but it's in the Galois orbit. And the reason is that Apart from the identity and complex conjugation, the elements of this Galois group act very discontinuously. They tear a bipartite map apart and then reassemble it. And that's what's happening here. Well, a number of properties of bipartite maps are invariant under G. This is something that Manfred Streit and I proved a number of years ago. It was actually a folklore result that we needed, uh, needed to have a proof. The number of edges, the valency distributions for the black and white vertices and the faces, the type, the genus, the monodromy group, and the automorphism group, they are all preserved by the, this Galois group. If I just go back to the example here, the valencies of the black and white vertices are the same in all cases. It's not so obvious what the monodromy group is, but it's S6 in all cases. You've got six edges, so it's a group of degree six, and in fact, it's S6 in every, every case. 
despite this. Th this restricts the action of the Galois group enormously, you might think, but nevertheless, this huge group, it's an uncountable group, it nevertheless acts faithfully up to isomorphisms on, well, Grotendieck first pointed out, and it's an easy observation, that there's a faithful action on these designs. It's still faithful if you fix the genus. Genus is preserved. So if, for any fixed genus, you've still got a faithful action. That was proved about 10, 15 years ago. If you restrict to plain trees, you might think these are the simplest maps you could possibly have, maps of genus zero with one face. Lila Schlepp's proved that the action there is faithful. Um, two years ago, Gabino and Andre proved that it's faithful on regular design. And Robert Kaczarczyk, this appeared on the archive just a month or two ago, if you restrict to regular design of a given hyperbolic type. That's excluding the maps on the sphere on the Euclidean plane, but those that live on hyperbolic surfaces, surfaces of genus greater than one, then you've got a faithful action. So if you look at any of these classes of design, then you can get a faithful action of this Galois group. And the consequence of this, I've just listed all these faithful actions again, but the consequence is that you can see all of algebraic number theory, because all of algebraic number theory is wrapped up in this one group. So if you understand that group, you understand algebraic number theory. And this gives you a hope of at least getting some insight by looking at these designs. Of course, life is not as easy as that. There's a big practical problem. <coughs> it's very difficult to work out explicit examples of how this Galois group acts on design. I've given you a couple of very simple examples here. There are, there are less trivial ones, but um, we could do with a, a lot more. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll just finish by talking about the regular design that come up from the um, um, complete and complete bipartite gra uh, graphs and how the absolute Galois group acts on them. And this is some work that I've been doing with Manfred Streit and Jürgen Wolfart in the last couple of years, and it builds on earlier work on um, topological graph theory by Steve Wilson, where he introduced some very useful operations on regular maps. If you go back to the classification of the complete bipartite, uh, of the complete graph embeddings, that was the formula for the number of bed embeddings. And the existence of phi in here suggested to us that there was a cyclotomic field involved, and that is indeed the case. Um, these can all be defined over the cyclotomic field of the n minus 1 roots of unity. In fact, over a particular subfield of it. And they're permuted transitively by the Galois group of that field, um, which has this order. So they form a single orbit of G. But in the bipartite case, um, again, we were able to find the field of definition, at least in the pr odd prime power case. Um, the number of regular embeddings is p to the e minus 1, if n is p to the e, and they split up into orbits of length phi of lower powers of p. And everything is defined over this cyclotomic field. And so again, we've, uh, we understand the action of the absolute Galois group here. And indeed, indeed, in some cases, we've actually got defining equations for the curves. In a way, that's successful, but it's disappointing because the absolute Galois group, it's acting as the Galois group of a cyclotomic field, and that means it's acting in as, a, as an abelian group. It's actually a highly non-abelian group. It's got a massive commutator subgroup, and that is in the kernel of the action. And by coincidence, this is rather similar to the situation that Alan Herman was discussing in his talk yesterday. He wasn't looking at maps on surfaces. He was looking at eigenvalues of graphs and of coherent configurations and so on. 
and asking when they are defined over, when they exist in cyclotomic fields. And again, in most of the familiar situations, they are elements of cyclotomic fields, but there are some exceptions. And that's what's happening here. We know, in fact, because of the faithful action of the absolute Galois group, that there must be many exceptions. There must be many cases where you need non-cyclotomic fields. But our limitations, our inability to calculate difficult examples, means that we're more or less forced to work with cyclotomic fields or those very close to them. So we're getting either abelian actions or actions that are very close to abelian. So the big outstanding problem is to find explicit orbits that exhibit these non-abelian actions and allow us to see not just the top, not just the abelian quotient of the um, absolute Galois group, but more of the internal structure. At the moment, we can see the tip of the iceberg up above the water, but there's a whole 90% or more of it underneath the water, and we'd like to know more about that. And I think that's a good place to stop, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes. Um, constructing polynomials with a given Galois group. Yeah, but it doesn't really relate to that. It does relate to constructing um, Galois groups, um, sorry, constructing, um, realizing particular groups as Galois groups. So if you like, constructing a polynomial with a given group as a Galois group. Um, because that amounts to showing that a given finite group is a quotient of the absolute Galois group by a closed normal subgroup. I haven't discussed the topology, but the absolute Galois group, it's a topological group, and the topology is important because the subfields correspond to closed subgroups. So really, what is going on behind the scenes here is the inverse Galois problem, where you're trying to realize all finite groups as Galois groups. Um, constructing specific polynomials doesn't really en enter into this. The specific polynomials do come up when you try to calculate um, Galois or um, orbits. The, that cubic polynomial that we had a few moments ago, that arises from that sort of calculation. Sorry, that wasn't a very satisfactory answer, but maybe we can talk about it a bit later. Yes, they they come up pretty naturally. There are um, principal congruent subgroups of the modular group. Yeah, um, the modular group is the free product of C two and C three. So what you're going to get is cubic maps, and um, if you if you reduce the modular group mod n, the kernel is the principal congruent subgroup of level n, and what you get is a map of type three two n. So it's a cubic map and the faces are n-gons, and these, these are very well understood. Number theorists know, know all about this situation. So the principal and the non-principal congruent subgroups of certain levels are, are realized, yes. There's no big problem with them. It's the non-congruent subgroups of the modular group that are much more interesting, because they predominate, but they're much harder to get a grip on. Yes? Sorry, can, can you speak up? You spoke of the whole subgroup. Yes. Subgroup can be used yes, there. yes. Uh, in these subgroups, you also have uh, some uh, separate formations and another conjugated class of such groups, uh, like the whole subgroup. And I don't know what are the properties that you really see uh, from these groups of the whole subgroup as a subgroup. 
Well, the, the properties of um, um, Hall subgroups that we needed were, were simply that they exist. If you take any um, set of primes dividing the order of a group, then there is a Hall subgroup. It, um, its order contains all those prime powers and nothing else. It's like Celo's theorem, but generalized to um, um, arbitrary sets of primes. So we needed the existence of, of these Hall subgroups. We also needed the existence of a Celo tower. So you can take the primes in a certain order and keep adding Celo subgroups, and you have a sequence of Hall subgroups. And this allowed us to work by induction on the number of primes dividing the order of the group. It was a very specific calculation that we needed for these complete bipartite graphs. It wouldn't w uh, apply in other situations, but it was simply the fact that the automorphism group had to be solvable and we could therefore apply Hall's theory. And it was, uh, it, it was those facts, together with some consequences of um, due to Vlant and Huppert of the fact that cy products of two cyclic groups are in fact metabelian. And that's a very powerful condition in this situation. So these groups were not just solvable, but they were easy solvable. And, and that's how it all worked. Thank you.